computer. There we go. All right, everybody's up. Brittany's free. And here we go. Blood glucose. This is the easiest uh, chapter out of all, all of them. Quick and easy. We'll probably be here five minutes or so. Maybe a little longer. There's our thing for today. A quick review on the insulin. How does it work? Insulin, we give it to patients, sub-Q on their belly, on their arm. I know on the checkoff, you ask the patient, do you want it on your left arm, right arm, right belly, right, left belly? But usually, actually, you just tell them where you're gonna give it to them. That's the best way. So what is it? What is insulin? It works by, we eat food. This is as simplistic as I can get with this. We eat food, it turns into sugar. When it turns into, when we have a high sugar, when we have sugar in our system, our pancreas starts releasing insulin into the cells. So these insulins convert the um, sugar into ATP and gives us energy. In a nutshell, this insulin blood sugar deal is all about energy. So the insulin is the key for getting glucose into the cells. Um, functions of the pancreas gland. There it is on the screen. You can look at it. I sent you this file. You can download it for your um, viewing pleasure. I only just want to talk about drugs. Oh, before I can talk about drugs, I need to talk about diabetes mellitus, which is the not even close to diabetes insipidus of what we talked about last week, I think, or maybe a couple of weeks ago. The diabetes insipidus, remember, it's about the body is dumping fluid out. It's being between five to 30 liters of uh, fluid per day. Somebody's trying to get in. So diabetes and mellitus, quick review. You, you guys know this already. High blood sugar, that is it. That's pretty much it, high blood sugar. And there's two types. Let me take you back to um, Dr. Vu's class, type one and type two. Type one, there is no insulin production. For whatever reason, your body is not producing insulin, which is bad. Type two, your body produces insulin, but for some reason, there's something blocking it from uh, getting into your system. So it's not getting absorbed. So the insulin, uh, due to the insulin resistance, it's not working out. You're not getting the insulin into the, to the cells. Why does Jose keep trying to get in? Jose, you gotta up, upgrade your AOL internet. Go to Best Buy and grab another free disc. Let's talk about type one real quick. Insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, usually rapid onset seen in younger people. Many ER visits are typically from type one diabetes because um, most, most of us, we don't know if we're diabetic. We don't, we, won't, we don't know that. We're just eating, drinking, living our lives. And uh, until one day we start feeling crap, we go to the um, primary care office and they check our blood sugar. It says 800 and they send you to the, um, to the emergency room because that is emergent. When, they get, when you get to the emergency room, we're gonna do some labs um, and A1C to be more specific. And then we're going to fix your blood sugar, take it back down to normal of 100s. And after that, we will diagnose you, Mr. Jones, you are officially a diabetic as of today. So what we're going to do with these people is that we're going to call the diabetic educator. These are the, these are the people in the hospital 
whose main job is to educate people on their diabetes. They don't do patient care. They, are, um, they have an office in the back somewhere. And when you put in a diabetic consult, they come out. They come out of the office. It's a good gig if you, um, um, if you like diabetes. Actually, it's a good retirement gig since, uh, because it's easy. So we're going to educate these type newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes patients so they can control their, their diabetes and go home and have a long, fruitful life. Then you have type 2, usually in the older adults, because it takes some time before your body starts blocking insulin. Same thing with these people, with these patients. We are diabetic educators in the hospital. They will also um, talk to these people so they can control their diabetes. How are we going to di diagnose these patients? Fasting blood sugar level greater than 126. But here's the gold standard. A1C greater than 6.5. You are considered diabetic. And you have sugar in your pee because you have so much sugar in your body, in your system, it's spilling over to the pee. Here's some terminal glycosuria. Here's some terminologies you should know. You should know these by now. If not, look at it, read it, try to memorize it. You don't need it for this. Um, you don't need most of it for this test, but at least the basics. Well, who, what am I looking for? Polyphagia, polydyspia. Uh, acidosis, glycosuria. Uh, if you're not familiar with these terms, know it, because it's, it's, this is the lingo we use in the hospital with our patients and our peers. And also you're gonna see these in the charts when you're reviewing them. Hyperglycemia, signs and symptoms, fatigue, lethargic, irritation, Polyuria, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, uh, I'm peeing too much, uh, I have sugar in my pee, but you're not going to know that until we test your pee. So uh, these are the signs and symptoms, and um, I'll get to the, the other one here in a few minutes. So what, why are we talking about diabetes? What is so important about these diabetes? I told this um, earlier from the other group. I have a friend who's diabetic, he's non-compliant, she's non-compliant, I always get on to her, I tell her, this, this is a big deal. Why, why is it a big deal? Because this can happen to you. You can have a stroke and you can have a heart attack. If you think diabetes is not a big deal, okay. If you have a stroke, you can sit in a nursing home for the rest of your life. I mean, we'll visit you every now and then, but if that's what the life you want to live, just because you don't want to comply, it's on you. Heart attack, mortality rate, mortality rate is up here. Don't remember off the top of my head, but heart attack is heart attack. It's an MI. Nothing good comes out of that. Diabetic ret retinopathy. Where are you? Your eye starts getting blurry. You have, you have to wear these thick glasses. You may need surgery, which is not going to work. Lastly, actually, it's not the last, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Your feet, they're throbbing, burning, stabbing, tingling. They're, they feel like sometimes you don't even, um, this is why I think if I remember from your A&P that uh, if you have a diabetic patient, you want them to constantly be cleaning, cleaning their feet, looking over them because um, because they don't feel much. Because if stabbing, tingling sensation is a constant for my lower extremities, if I step on a nail or, a, or, or something, then I'm not going to know I have a wound there. In severe cases, I step on a, on a nail, gives me a wound. And since I have no sensation, I don't know, or I'm used to the, these throbbing, burning sensations, I don't know if it's getting worse. Worst case scenario, they're, um, they get amputated. 
And lastly, you have this. This is what I was getting on to my friend about. Worst case scenario, you're going to be in the on dialysis that because of diabetic retinop uh, nephropathy. Your kidneys are going to start slowing, slowing down, slowing down until eventually they're going to stop working. And uh, hey, if dialysis life is your thing, you can do that. Three days a week, go to the dialysis clinic, four hours a pop, more power to you. It's covered by Medicare, though. One of the diseases covered by Medicare. Four signs of impending dangerous complications of hyperglycemia. Key word here is dangerous. Since it's dangerous, I kind of want you to know this. If I want you to know this, I may put it on the test. Because it's dangerous, you need to know this. Rudy breath. Classic signs hyperglycemia. The fruity breath, as the ketones build up in the system, they're excreted through the lungs. That's so, whew, whew, I have fruity, fruity breath. Next, dehydration. As fluid and important electrolytes are lost through the kidneys. My kidneys that hopefully are still working, but I'm starting to get dehydrated. I'm getting thirsty. I'm getting thirsty a lot. I need some water. Two more, Kuzmal respirations. As the body, oh, where are you? As the body tries to get rid of um, a high acid levels. SpongeBob is exaggerating it a little bit, but <sighs> this is a, an oh crap moment. We need to do something about it. And lastly, another dangerous complication of hyperglycemia is. Oh, there, loss of orientation and coma. So that's those four are the four dangerous signs, complications of hyperglycemia. Know them. Sites of action of diabetes drugs. You don't need to know that. That's too much information. I just want to talk about drugs. Let's talk about insulin. I don't know what kind of needle this is I saw. This looks like there's two chambers, maybe two chambers and going into one needle. It's kind of weird. So what is insulin? You know what insulin is. It's what we give our diabetic patients. It's what I talked about it already. Um, what you need to know is what's the indications for insulin? It's for type one because their body does not produce insulin. So this little prick that we give them gives them insulin in the system. Seems fairly straightforward. Then you also have type two. Do we give this to type two? Huh, I did not know that. Actually we do. Even though type two, there's a insulin resistance, we will still give them insulin. Oh, there's an asterisk there though. Why, when? Sometimes, only sometimes. These are situational based. Because if I, one situation is, if I have a patient on insulin, uh, I mean, type two diabetic, on metformin, actose, whatever pill I'm taking for my type two diabetes, and I have to go to the hospital for surgery. They're gonna put me on steroids, on certain antibiotics that will increase my, my, um, my blood sugar levels. That means I am gonna require more, uh, I need more insulin. So the uh, pill I'm taking may not be enough to, um, to get my blood sugar down. So temporarily, while I'm in the hospital, on these medications, you are gonna give me type two diabetic insulin temporarily. That's why there's an asterisk there for sometimes. Um, insulin peak onset and duration. That is gonna be part big part of the test. Peak onset and duration. Because you need to know how what are the fast acting? What are the quick acting insulin? What are the slow acting? If my blood sugar is 800 and you decide to give me Levimir, wrong answer, fail. Not only fail, I'm gonna die. 
because it's the wrong insulin for me. Drug to drug, drug to drug interactions. From here with the insulin, uh, there's a list on my notes, but the most important drug to drug interaction that you wanna know, you need to know is your beta blockers. Because the, if you remember beta blockers slow down the heart rate, lowers blood pressure. So when that happens, it blocks the signs and symptoms of hypo, hypoglycemia. So now I don't know if I'm getting hypoglycemic, early signs of hypoglycemia, which is tachycardia. But now I don't know if I'm getting that because you gave me beta blockers. You gave me 50 milligrams of low pressure and now my heart rate is 40. And I don't know if I'm, my blood sugar is uh, getting really, really low or is it the cardiac medicine that you gave me? Easy answer is, is to check my blood sugar, but don't do that. Just don't mix the two together. So, so there's no guessing. What are the contraindications for insulin? None. If they need insulin, they need insulin. It's not a, it's not a drug. Oh, it is a drug. It's, some, it's something that our body produces. I have it in my system right now. We all have it. So there's no uh, contraindications for it. There's no, nobody's allergic to it. It's, it's like being allergic to air, allergic to water. At least, not that I know, or I haven't heard of anybody who's allergic to insulin, haven't heard, haven't read. Nobody has, has ever been allergic to insulin. So if they need insulin, they will get insulin. Pregnancy and lactation, caution with these people for the uh, gestational diabetes. That's all I'm going to say about that. Adverse effect of insulin. What is the biggest adverse effect of insulin? Give me some, uh, yell it out or type it in the box. Biggest adverse effect. What is it? Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. Ding, ding, ding. Correct. Because it is so easy to overdose somebody on insulin. This is why most of you guys are in the hospital setting. So um, for Valley Health System, Anderson, Spring Valley, Summerlin, all them, and uh, HCA, Mountain View, Sunrise, they all require two nurses to witness as a witness for um. No, one nurse to witness for insulin uh, administration. I'm not sure about UMC and St. Rose because I'm not there. I'm pretty sure it is because it's, it's, it's a safety thing. Types of insulin. Here we go. Number one, rapid acting. Rapid acting is uh, it works within under 15 minutes. As soon as you poke my patient, it's going to start working in under 15 minutes. My these are your Lispro, aspartamine. I don't know about glulacine. We don't see that as much in the hospital. But um, typically, if you have a patient that's uh, that are on meal regimen. Uh, sometimes they're, they're supposed to get, let's say, five units of insulin with every meal. This is the one you're going to give them, the rapid acting, because you're going to give them the insulin. They're going to eat their food. You're going to give them your insulin. They're gonna, their sugar is going to drop down a little bit. They're going to eat their food, bring them back up. So you're back to square one. Next. Short acting. Do not, please do not mix up rapid acting and short acting. Rapid acting onset is under 15 minutes. Short acting's onset is between 30 minutes to 60 minutes to an hour. Big difference. If my blood sugar is oh, 300 and you want to take me back down quickly, you're gonna give me rapid acting, aspartamine. 
versus if you decide to give me short acting, it's gonna come down eventually within the next 30 minutes to uh, an hour. And also if you have a, um, if you have an insulin a, a patient whose in blood sugar levels is at, um, let's say seven, eight, 900, that's very high. This is, what, this is a critical level. That means this patient is now going to require IV insulin. And when we do give them IV insulin, we, the pharmacist simply mixes regular insulin with normal saline. And I think that's maybe in one of your drug calculation tests. Um, so that's it. Regular insulin is for the IV insulin. And uh, most of the um, sliding scale you see in your uh, hospital, in, your, in the patient that you're taking care of, pay attention to it, pay attention to it next time. It's going to be the rapid acting insulin. Next. We have intermediate and long acting insulin. Do not mix up both of them. Intermediate. Onset is one to one and a half hours. NPH is one of them. And uh, long acting. Onset is, what did I say? One to two hours. But these things, with the intermediate, it stays in the system, in the body, for up to 18 hours. But the long acting, it stays in the, um, in the body for 24 hours. Look at the difference between the Dedimir or Levimir and Glargine. Glargine. Um, Levimir has an onset of one to two hours. Glargine has nothing. It's a constant release of insulin straight through for the next 24 hours. So question is, if I'm a truck driver, um, driving from Vegas to Florida, and I do not want to poke myself every four hours for my insulin regimen. I would tell the, my physician, Dr. Jones, can you give me some long acting insulin for the next, for, that would last me 24 hours because I'm going to be driving a truck and I don't want to have to poke myself every couple of hours. I just want a con slow, continuous uh, flow of insulin. And Levimir or Dedimir is my answer for that. Now let's mix it up. So when you, uh, in the clinical setting, when you're administering uh, um, insulin, you either have a syringe for the short acting and another syringe for long acting. Completely separate. When you take it out of the pixels, two separate jugs, short acting and long acting, two different pokes. However, mixing of insulin was the standard of care not too long ago, for a very long time. We don't do that anymore because, um, because of errors. Um, it's not as easy to use. Well, it was the standard of care, but now with the technology, it is so much simpler to dial a number, 14 units of insulin, click, 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 poke, poke myself. Um, we don't do this anymore, but as I told the other group, we still teach it. We still teach it, we still test it because there's still a, um, a small percent of diabetic people who are still mixing their medications their insulin, so we need to know about this. We need to know how it's done. Because just imagine if you are a, um, if you're a um, diabetic patient of the past 40 years, you have your diabetes under control using the, uh, by mixing long acting and short acting, there is no way I can sell you into the new technology of, Levimir, where you dial it in, pop. I can't even sell you a patch on your shoulder or your belly that you can control on your phone how much insulin 
it give the pump gives you based on what you're eating and what you're doing. No way. So if I do try to convert them into that, maybe they they won't get it, which is going to lead to non-compliance, which is going to lead to complications. Their blood sugar is going to be out of control. So it's best for these patients to just stick with what they know and what they have. But as the population, these populations are, are getting older, they're dying and we are phasing out of the uh, mixing of insulin. But for now, we still, well, we don't mix it, but you need to know how to mix it. This is how to mix it. This is a refresher from your 304 course. It was part of the checkoff, if I remember. Step one, if I need 30 units of uh, long acting insulin and 10 units of short acting insulin, to the left, I'm gonna inject 30 units of air in the, in the long acting first, take it out, 10 units of air in the, reg, in the short acting regular, flip it over, take my 10 units out, and then insert my needle into the long acting. Okay, so um, so that's that. I'm sh I don't know if some of you have dispensed insulin in the um, uh, at the Pixis machine with your nurses. Some of them don't. They don't even inject the air. Do you really need to inject the air? Book answer is yes. Uh, practicality answer is, eh, uh, let me just take my 4C, 0 0.04 units of insulin. So book answer is yes, I need to inject the air. I'm gonna give you a different you? answer if we're in a clinical setting though. Did you have a question? I was gonna say, do you inject air? Do you, oh. no, oh. okay, just wondering. <laughs> because, Usually if I'm, if I'm, if you're pulling out, what is it? Let's say 30 CC, what is that? That's 0.3 ml. What is that? That's about two drops. I don't need to do that, but you guys get the point. Usually with this, I don't really pay much attention to this drug card that's provided by the pharmacy book company. But in this case, you want to know this drug card. This is the test right there. You want that. I want to know who's the shortest, who has the shortest uh, onset of insulin? Is it the regular? Is it the NPH? Is it the Levimir? Is it the Detimir? I don't know. That's right there in front of you. Uh, short, medium, long, who's who? Sounds like a select all applied question. Select the best answer, select all. No, something different. Maybe mix and match. You guys will see it. Nursing considerations for insulin. Eh, yeah, standard, standard. This is what's important for the insulin uh, exercise amount. We are not just gonna give you a generic dose of insulin. I need to know. Do you exercise? How much? I don't. I like to sit on the couch and just eat Twinkies and fries all day. So if I'm on an insulin regimen, just give me the low dose, Dr. Jones. I don't do much activity. I'm kind of, I like to drink my beer, sit on the couch, watch Netflix. So I don't need much. But then you have um, uh, LeBron James, who let's say he's diabetic. He's going to require much more, actually, I'm gonna require more. I did it the opposite. I'm gonna require more. LeBron James is gonna require less because he's burning up a lot of energy. Next, glucose levels. In the hospital settings, you may have not been paying attention to this. If you have a patient on an insulin sliding scales, there's two, two sliding scales and they're different. First is a low dose insulin sliding scale. The next is the high dose insulin sliding scale. 
So the next time you're administering insulin to your patient, pay attention. If the patient's blood sugar is at 200, maybe patient A will be receiving one unit, maybe two units of insulin versus patient in room B who's on a high scale insulin there um, for that, for the glucose level of 200, they will be, they'll probably receive four or five units of, um, of insulin because their baseline um, glucose level is much higher. A1C talking about lab values, med list. This is a major player. This is, might even be associated with the other part of the, um, the lecture from last week, the glucocorticosteroids. If I have somebody on glucocorticosteroids, I'm sure you, all of you remember from last week that one of the biggest side effect of glucocorticoids is blood sugar up. So now I have a patient on insulin um, and also on steroids. That means I'm going to have to give them more than what they need because I have to give them insulin uh, for their baseline and also to compensate for the um, blood sugar spikes that the steroids will give me. Ah, oh, here's a pop quiz. I might be, if you get this right in three seconds, I'll throw it in the test. Oh, I clicked it. Damn it. I clicked it soon, too soon. What is the most important information you need to, you need to know before administering insulin? Well, there's the answer. I ruined my suspense. But you need to know their sugar, their blood sugar levels before you inject somebody with insulin. It does not matter if it's short acting, long acting, intermediate acting. You need to know. In fact, for the Valley Health System, you need to enter a number before you poke your patient. as on the MAR. It doesn't matter if they check the sugar, the blood sugar 30 minutes ago, an hour ago, two hours ago. The computer just wants to know what was the last blood sugar? Because if, the, if, because if you're trying to administer 50 of Levimir and your last blood sugar check was at 53, oh, that should, there should be a connection there somewhere. This should be a stop pause, let me think about this for a minute. It's another safety feature. So we do not overdose our patient because it's so easy to do. What you also have probably seen in the uh, hospital setting is that it requires witness. And when they do, I would just get, hey, Samantha, can you witness my insulin? I'm taking it out of the pixies. Okay. They, type their name, put, put in their uh, fingerprint and they walk away. They don't really witness, which is okay for convenience purposes, but for, for patient safety purposes, no. Because if I decide, if I don't have my glasses on, Samantha walks away and I have 15 units of regular insulin as opposed to 15, she did not witness it because she walked away, but on paper, she witnessed it on the computer and it's a recipe for failure. Next, where does the insulin work? Eh, you can look, look, about, eh, you can look at it. Now let's talk about some PO medications. Insulin's done, PO. There's multiple actually multiple classes of oral hypoglycemic medications. Metformin is the most frequently prescribed and gliburide, you will see these. You probably have administered this. If you're in my clinical group, you probably have told the patient, Mrs. Jones, here's your metformin for your diabetes. That's it, nothing else. Here's your gliburide for your blood sugar. That's it. Step number one, metformin or glucophage. They don't really know how this 
medication works. But as far as they know, it works by reduction of hepatic glucose production. That's all they got. And um, the side effects associated with this are GI, because it's PO, it goes in the belly, it affects the GI, I get nauseated. Sometimes I may get diarrhea, loss of appetite. If you haven't seen the, uh, the correlations between side effects and medications, I have um, most of my PO medications, side effects are GI um, associated because it, it, it goes through the um, stomach to, for processing. So what are we gonna monitor these patients? Same thing, hypoglycemia. It doesn't matter if you're giving me insulin or a pill. It's going to lower my blood sugar. So you need to check me. You're probably going to check me, my blood sugar, ACHS, before and after meals, every four hours, every six hours. But you are checking my blood sugar every so often. Lactic acidosis, GI upset because of uh, the side effects. Oh, here's a big one. Do not. I should have highlighted this or um, put a star by this. Do not give with IV contrast dye. Ooh, what does that mean? It means this medication, metformin, is a nephrotoxic drug, meaning it's bad for the kidneys. IV contrast dye, it's also a nephrotoxic drug. It's the dye that the patient, that the CT scanners use, I mean, CT techs use, to inject the patient so they can do the CAT scan and they can see the brain, the heart, the lungs, whatever body part they're looking at. It illuminates it. It's great for diagnostic purposes, bad for the kidneys. So now I have a highly nephrotoxic drug called metformin and a highly nephrotoxic drug, uh, the IV contrast, one-two punch combo, bad news. Bad news for um, my kidneys. I can, we can kill some kidneys because of this combination. So usually the CT tech will call the uh, nurse or, or they will be on order in the chart. Hey, your patient is on metformin, hold it for today. Our protocol says, hold it for today. Our protocol says, hold it for the next three days. Whatever it might be, you need to be holding it but their blood sugar is gonna get higher. It's okay, I don't care. We're not killing this patient's kidneys. Give them some insulin, call the provider, do something about it, but do not, do not give them this metformin because I'm about to give my, this patient some IV contrast. And we do not want patient Mrs. Jones to get on dialysis just because you wanna give this pill and I have to give this IV contrast. Next. Hey, Alex. Yeah. Is, uh, is the metformin part of the uh, consent form? Ooh, you have to go to it might be as part of the question because there's a, uh, it might be. Now I have to look at that on the, uh, because there's some, um, there's consents for the CAT scan, there's questionnaire. Good one. Yeah, let's look at that. I think it might be. Are you on metformin? I think. Good one. I'll look at it next time. We're in the hospital on Thursday. So falling, so falling illurious. I can't say this. So falling illurious. Oh, another word is um, glyburide, glypozide. These are the second generation PO uh, anti diabetic medications. What do we need to know about them? Metformin is usually the first choice. This is the second choice. What are we looking for? Same hypoglycemia, GI issues. I don't know about this allergic skin reactions, but um, with this one, interactions are drugs that acidifies the urine, such as vitamin C, KFOS, sodium, sodium, uh, what is sodium bicarb? There's that beta blockers again. 
and uh, alcohol, no excessive alcohol for this one. What did I say here? Same for metformin. So with this medication, glyburide, I take it, it starts working within the hour. So now, if I, have a, if I have a blood sugar of 300 and you need to bring my blood sugar down, this should not even be in your mind. Brittany Green. Huh. This should not be even. Ah, free Brittany. Brittany Green is trying to get in. Brittany, you're free. Uh, this should not be even in your mind when you're thinking about uh, bringing my blood sugar down. A, it works within the hour. And because I'm going to take it, it has to go through my GI tract. It has to process. It takes some time. And you want to bring my blood sugar down. PO should not be an option if you're trying to bring my blood sugar down quickly. It should be um, sub-Q or IV. Other diabetic, there's other classes of anti-diabetics drugs available. Um, this is what they are. Different categories, different classifications. You do not need to know them. This is more for show and tell to let you know that you're gonna see these medications out in the field, out in the, out in the hospital setting. And uh, it's your job to know them. If you see, if a patient is trying to take Bayera, Invocana, Genuvia. I, I see Actos and Genuvia a lot. Um, they can take it because most of the time, this is what you see on the, on the ad, newspaper ad or TV ads. Um, mo a lot, these medications have a higher copay. I don't know what's so special about these drugs, depending on the type of diabetes the patients have. But if they're in a hospital and they are to take Actos or Genuvia, most hospitals do not carry these in the formulary. So what we can offer them is, Mrs. Jones, we don't have Genuvia in our formulary because it's too much. Well, we're not going to say that. Because, but well, we can give you uh, metformin or glyposide in the meantime. And they're more than likely going to tell you, no, I don't want that stuff. I've been taking my Genuvia for two years now, and I like it. It has my, gets my blood sugar under control. So what you're going to do is, okay, take your Genuvia, but I'm going to take the bottle from you so I can send it to our pharmacy and they can dispense it to us um, for our policy. And then when we're done on your way home, before you go home, I'll grab it from the pharmacy and we'll give the rest to you. We just cannot keep a bottle of pills or medications at the bedside or in your purse. It's not a hospital, um, it's against hospital policy. So they can take whatever they want and it's okay. Same thing with these medications. We are assessing for hypoglycemia, Same, same, same. Next, let's talk about, I'm done with the hyperglycemia. Insulin, blood sugar, done. Now let's talk about hypoglycemia. When my blood sugar concentration is low, lower than 40, some references may say hypoglycemia is less than 60 to 70, and eh, that's okay. Hypoglycemia is, um, in the clinical setting, is defined by your patient. You're going to see it in the chart because it's going to be on your sliding scale. Administer hypoglycemic medications if their blood sugar is less than 80, less than 60, less than 40. It depends on your patient. So what are the causes of um, hypoglycemia? 
starvation. We're not starving. We don't starve patients. Actually, it depends on which unit you're in. We don't, we purposely do not starve patients in the hospital. One example I gave uh, was that uh, if I come in the hospital, I'm about to, I'm scheduled for uh, abdominal surgery tomorrow morning, first thing tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. It is now noon. I'm scheduled is for tomorrow. That means I have to be NPO. I'm in, so now I'm going to be NPO for the next, what, 16 hours to prep for my uh, surgery. That sucks. My blood sugar is going to be down. That's what it means by starvation. And here comes uh, tomorrow morning, eight o'clock surgery. Dr. Kevorkian is on, had a car accident and cannot get to the surgery. Oh, shoot. That means now what? That means I have to wait longer, longer until doctor, until when Dr. Kevorkian can come to the hospital and do my surgery. Let's say he has to call, had to call the insurance and all that stuff, had to deal with a car accident. And it, it is now one o'clock and they still have to prep for the surgery. And now it's almost what, 24 hours, maybe even longer that I haven't had any food or anything in my stomach. So now my blood sugar is gonna go low. Watch, keep monitoring my blood sugars, please. Next, OD of hyperglycemia medications. I talked about this already. It is so easy to overdose somebody on insulin. If I'm looking at an insulin syringe with 15 units of, of insulin, and uh, maybe my glasses are blurry, and instead of 15, it's actually 25, and I just give nurse Karen the go signal. Yep, I see 15, it's all good, but I really did not see 15. I was actually 25. You inject the patient with 25 units of insulin, and blood sugar goes, whoosh, we now have a crisis just because of me. Alert, alert, alert. This crisis I'm speaking of, hypoglycemia is a life-threatening condition. And every time you're administering sub-Q, P-O, I-V, any, anything, you should be looking out for this. I know... I'm no, I'm I'm there with you guys that you give the sub Q, you walk away, and yeah, that's not a big deal. But just kind of check on them every now and then. And especially you, when you get to know your patient, you know if they're if they start getting confused or starts talking funny, because they are going to show these signs and symptoms for hypoglycemia. They're gonna start being shaky, sweaty, dizzy, confusion, hungry, weak, tired, headache, nervous, or upset. They feel like crap. Something they know, if they're long-term diabetic, they know their blood sugar is low. I had a student last semester, uh, she was pregnant and uh, that was our cue to go to lunch. She had a thing on her shoulder and around 11 o'clock, she would feel kind of off weak. She would tap her iPhone to her shoulder and would say, blood sugar is 45. Oh, sure, that's, that's our cue to go to lunch right now. So I would round up the troops. It's time to go to lunch. And then she also have, has candy bars and other stuff she has in her pocket all the time. Pop quiz. You can put it in the text box, yell it out to me, email me, telegram me, text me. So this upper right here, confusion, hypoglycemia. If my patient is confused and is, and is having difficulty speaking, what signs, what is a disease process? What kind of illness, what kind of thing should I associate it, confusion and difficulty speaking with? 
What is the first thing that comes into your mind if your patient is now confused and is having a hard time talking? Stroke. Seizures. Karen. Mm, seizures. If I'm seizing, I will not be talking to you. Spoke. If I'm spoken to you, that means I'm talking to you. That means I'm not having a difficulty speaking. Lack of oxygen to the brain. Not yet. Not yet. That's late, Sasha. But stroke is the answer. Because if you're talking to me and we're talking about the, the hockey game, Canadians won, actually Tampa Bay won. Whoa, they did a good job. And then next thing you know, I'm talking about my speech is a lot short and I'm having trouble speaking. And now I'm talking about unicorns and rainbows. This is a no crap moment. First thing that comes, that should come into your mind should be stroke. Oh crap, your patient is stroking out right now. What are you gonna do? Of course, you're gonna call for help. You're gonna notify your supervisor, clinical supervisor, charge nurse, whatever they're called in your unit. Uh, charge nurse, my patient is having a stroke. I'm even gonna call, peek, peek, peek. Rapid response, need you, I need you. My patient is uh, showing signs and symptoms of stroke. They're gonna come and the first thing, what is the first thing they're gonna do? Guess, type it in the text box. That's a pop quiz question. Might be even be on a test question. A, B, C, yes. That's a good answer. Good answer, give O2, good answer. You know, I'm looking for the best answer. Check the blood sugar. Check the blood sugar, correct, because hypoglycemia oftentimes mimics stroke. So as a rapid response person, I wanna check their blood sugar to let, just to rule it out. If my blood sugar comes back at 209, okay, it's not hypoglycemic. Let's go to CAT scan right now. We're going for a CAT scan of the brain and follow the, the code white protocol. If it is, um, if, they're, if you, they check the blood sugar and if it, it's, it says 29, okay, maybe it's not a stroke. Let's go give this patient some, uh, some uh, emergency, some D50 and, um, and that should be it. So treatment for hypoglycemia, right there. Ooh, I should have left that open. Uh, if my blood sugar is uh, 55 and I, I'm feeling kind of off, I think I'm, my mouth is start, starting to get shaky. Um, I'm starting to get thirsty. Um, first thing is give me some apple juice. Give me something. Give me a candy, just like that pregnant um, uh, lady I was talking about earlier. If she went... She knows when her blood sugar is low and she would whip out a Kit Kat or something. She would eat it and she would start feeling better. In a hospital setting, if we have somebody like that, we can give them apple juice, orange juice. The juice is depending on what kind of disease process they have too. So uh, what I normally do for these patients is I would give them an orange juice and I would rip up I would add about two to three packs of um, sugar to it. Pop, 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 stir it up. My blood sugar of 55, take this and give it a couple of minutes and they're gonna start feeling better. Okay. Next, there's also this thing called glucagon. If you're a diabetic, this should be uh, in your purse somewhere. It's an emergency thing that you can do, it's a sub, it's a I am shot that you can give yourself. Here's another pop quiz. My blood sugar is 29. My blood sugar is 25. 
check my blood sugar 25. Now what? What would you give me? Now you're, damn, did you, you guys reading my notes? Why are you giving, you giving me the answer? You guys are pre-reading my notes, which is a good thing. That is the answer though. D50 is my emergency, oh, right there. D50 is my emergency drug in the hospital setting because I have an IV. I cannot speak for, uh, for the EMS in the trucks. I think they immediately drop an IV and they push D50. I don't know their protocol. But for the hospital, pay attention to your, um, to your insulin sliding scale next time. You're going to see if their blood sugar is uh, low, give them D50. First, give them, give them an oral something. And then D50, half an amp, one amp whatever the dosage is. So pop quiz, my blood sugar, you said, give me D50. Why would you not give me apple juice? My blood sugar is 29. My blood sugar is 25. Give me apple juice. Would you rather give me apple juice with a little bit of sugar than aspiration? Britney Spears is talking about aspiration. That is correct. You're officially free, Brittany. Correct. Because if my blood sugar is 29 or very low, 25, I will probably look like, oh, or I might not even respond to you because that's very low. So if I'm not responding to you because of my very low blood sugar, do not waste your time trying to figure out if I can swallow. Only give me the apple juice, candy, Kit Kat bars, M&Ms, if I'm awake and alert and I can swallow. If I'm not, give me something IV. Give me the D50. That is my emergent, med emergent drug. In fact, on your insulin sliding scale, it will say that. Administer D50 if unable to swallow. So keep that in mind next time. So my blood sugar is 20, 21. You give me uh, an amp of D50. Now what? What are you gonna do now? What's the next step? Give it to me. Recheck blood sugar, check sugar, recheck blood sugar. That is correct. Check my blood sugar. Why? Because I don't know if it worked. They might need another dose. Because if you give me a D50, my blood sugar is 12. You give me D50, um, you check my blood sugar within five minutes, 10 minutes. And it says from 12, my blood sugar is now 24. Okay, I need another dose hit me up with another dose of D50. So whatever you gave me the first time was not enough. So keep checking, keep checking. And it doesn't matter what the hospital protocol is for recheck. It could be 50, recheck the, the blood sugar in 15 minutes, in 10 minutes. Regardless of whatever it says, check my blood sugar when you feel like you need to check my blood sugar. So if the protocol says recheck my blood sugar in 15 minutes, I am not gonna wait 15 minutes if I think I did not give enough in, um, D50 to my patient. If I feel like I need to check this sugar in five minutes, I will. If I need to check it again in 10 minutes, I will, I'm not waiting. Next. That's it, what would you do? Use of diabetic agents across the lifespan in children. It is difficult to manage kids and diabetic medications because their activity level, it's, you don't know if they're in school, they're running around, are they sitting in a corner somewhere? You don't know what their activity is. Plus you don't, you can't control what they're eating. Did they have the hot dog or the pizza in the cafeteria or did they eat the, the diabetic meal you gave them in their uh, lunchbox? You don't know, or maybe they threw that away. Um, 
for adults, extensive education is needed. That is why we have these registered nurses as, as diabetic educators in a hospital. And that's all they do. They sit in an office, they watch Netflix all day until they get a consult. Oh, they got a consult, room 421. Damn it, I guess I'll pause this and go see the patient. And then they give them, they teach the patient everything they need to know about the diabetes. Their job is to teach the patient because if they fail on their job, the patient is going to be non-compliant and they're going to come back. And when they come back, it might be worse. And if they keep coming back, that means it's going to become a circle and they'll have more uh, adverse effect. They might more adverse um, effect from the diabetes. On the older adults though, injection, injection is their number one teaching. Because if they're on insulin-dependent diabetics, it is difficult for them to, to control the sub-Q shots. The dial pins made it easier for them. But as I was saying earlier, some of them don't want any of that new technology. They want to draw it up themselves. And if so, they can. But if they can't see, and if they are... The, or the needle is too little, then it might, they might give themselves the wrong dose. So sell, it's, it's hard to sell the new technology to the elderly, but education, education, education. Question. Eh. Eh, nothing there. Oh, look at this. List three medications in the order of fastest onset to the slowest or slowest to the fastest. And let's skip all that. Right there, oops. Right there, you need to know this because you need to know what kind of insulin you are giving your patient. Is it gonna work in 10 minutes? 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or maybe it's gonna work later after lunch. You need to know this. As we do administer these insulins at work, I mean, in the hospital. What is the gold standard test for the, for the blood glucose? Eh, this is too easy. It's not gonna be on the test, it's too easy. So I talked about insulin, hyperglycemic medications, hypoglycemic medications. It's fairly straightforward. Insulin, they're short acting, long acting. Watch for hypoglycemia. For hypoglycemia, my choices are, what are my choices? Apple juice, orange juice, or D50? Well, there's some stuff in between there. You do need to know the signs and symptoms of uh, hyper and hypoglycemia. That's all I got. This is, uh, told you, I'll be done in five minutes. Are you ready? Yes, you are, because it's easy. This is one of the easiest tests. It's almost a gimme. It's a freebie test. You may not even have to study for it. Although I recommend you do. Questions? If you don't know yet, I've updated the, the study guide the, on Google Doc. I've, I did that a few days ago. It's been up. In case you didn't, haven't seen it yet, it's right here. I cut and paste this from the Google Doc. Let's go through it. Growth hormone deficiency. That's easy. DDAVP contraindications. Growth hormone indications, contraindications. There was something there about this growth hormones that would 
I don't want to give it to you, then I'm telling you what's on the test that would make me use it versus not. Signs and symptoms of water toxicity. This is the diabetes insipidus we were talking about. Master gland. I talked about that. That's kind of, that's the key piece for the um, thyroid medications. There's that glucocoil, gluco, gluco, there's the steroids. Patient education on the steroids. It may be related to the insulin because if you don't know it by now, one of the side effects of glucocorticoids of steroids is blood sugar goes up, 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 up. That is common knowledge. If it's not common knowledge, make it a common knowledge as of right now. Steroids, blood sugar up. Oh, so now I'm talking about steroids, blood sugar up in my insulin. How are they going to be related? Adrenal crisis, signs and symptoms, hypothyroid, signs and symptoms, cretinism, the little kid, treatment of, um, uh, and treatment, plan of care. I think there was only one. So that should be fairly straightforward. I even gave you the, what the labs look like for a hypothyroid patient. Um, patient education. Oh, somebody asked me about select all that apply. I think this is one of those select all that apply question. Patient education on levothyroxine or Synthroid because there's a lot of them. It's, it's more than eat this, uh, eat this pill with spaghetti or eat it with ramen noodles before you go to bed. There's a, there's, there's a lot of moving parts with this medication because it's a special drug. I've talked about this, that this drug is so special that we do it separate. It's not part of the AM or PM medication regimen. That's why. Um, new onset of what? Normalization levels, probably about for our thyroid levels, hypothyroidism signs and symptoms, PTU interactions. Ah, uh, there it is. Insulin type, onset peak dura duration. Mm, let me make it easy on you. Delete peak and duration. I'm not going to ask you for peak and duration. May, it's, um, I just want you to know the onset. When is this thing going to kick in? Safe administration of insulin. I mentioned a few, more than a few. That might be a... So like all that apply, signs and symptoms of hyper and hypoglycemia. Type two meds, PO versus sub Q. Ah, what, what do I mean by that? When should I give PO meds versus sub Q meds for type two diabetes? I think that's one of the first few slides. Rapid response. Ah, you guys remember that storyline with the stroke, treatment for hypoglycemia. We just talked about that 10 minutes ago. Adverse effect of anticholinergic. Oh, now that we're going to the, I think that might be the second or third slide from the beginning. Indications for atropine. Atropine is an emergency drug. That's why I threw it up there. You need to know this. I forgot for which one though. No. Atropine, emergency drug for what? Treatment for IBS, mm, anticholinergic drugs, fluid onset of atropine. Since I'm talking about emergency drug atropine, how fast or slow does it work? There's a storyline there with a stroke patient and a PO medic blood pressure medicine. When should, can I take my blood pressure medicine on the stroke patient? Hmm. What to assess for with dopamine? Dopamine is a uh, one of, is a vasopressor that was covered, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, but there's something special about this medication. I use this medication to increase my blood pressure and it also does blank. I'll give it to you, then that's the test. Breathing medications. 
This is in, uh, I think I was telling the other group, this is in one of the, in the lab, one of the storylines when we go to the labs. I have a patient who's having a hard time breathing. Give me my inhaler. You're giving me the wrong one. Give me the right one. No, this is the right one. So question is, which is the right one based on what you're doing right now, based on your symptoms right now? You're short of breath right now. So I'm not going to give you this one. I'm going to give you the quick acting one. I gave it, just gave it to you. Uh, changes in BP when titrating IV pressors. This is what happens when you're titrating these um, vasopressors. So what does it mean? Does, it, does they work right away? Do I, do I have to wait? What is, what, what is that? Um, amiodarone indications. There's only one. Wait. There is. At least the, what I told you, there's only one. I hope there's only one that I told you. If not, I hope I don't have to throw that all out because that's, that's a good question. Adrenergic antagonists, that's the opposite of the fight or flight thing. BPH, there it is again, treatment for BPH. There's only one. I think in one of my, if you're gonna watch my lectures again, I think I said, when I say BPH, it should, this should be the first thing that comes to your mind, blank. There it is. Beta blockers for treatment of angina. Hold parameters for the beta blockers. This is something we administer in the hospital all the time. So uh, kind of like my beta blocker questions. Pentolamine in um, indications. Um, my patient with Alzheimer's and dementia treatment. Oh, here's another one. This is, and there's almost, there's a few gimmies on this one. Tensilon test. When I say from the previous lecture, I think I said, when I say tensilon, tensilon, this should be the first thing that comes into your mind. And this should be the only thing that comes into your mind because it's, it's what it's for, nothing else. Atropine, ACLS. Mm. Is atropine part of ACLS? I don't know. I forgot. That's it. That's all I got. If you have any questions, you can call me, text me. Uh, if you're going to don't ask me on Canvas email because for some reason I don't get the notification. It's, it's best if you text me so I see it right away. Or the NSC email, just not the Canvas email. Questions? Somebody's birthday today? Some people's birthday today? Do we need to sing? Whose birthday? Happy birthday, Michelle. It's Michelle's Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Michelle. Happy birthday, birthday Michelle. Michelle. Thanks, guys. Are you guys going to sing? No singing? I'll sing. OK, go. No, I'm joking. I won't sing. Oh. Yeah. All right, guys, on um, that note, I will stop recording and I will see you Thursday, Friday. Stop share. That's it.